Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Justin Blinko. Today, we welcome Bailey Reutzel to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Bailey was one of the first financial reporters to cover Bitcoin before banks would even acknowledge its existence. You know, I was covering it all the time, and a bunch of companies that I covered back in the day are like no longer around. <laughs> and it's not necessarily because they were bad companies, they were just a little bit too soon. They were before regulation, and once regulation hit, it's like, oh shit, what do we do now? She just finished a six-month, 48-state road trip and wrote an article about each state's financial and economic culture. Show notes at libertyentrepreneurs.com link to an article that The Atlantic wrote that gives a good primer on Bailey's motivation behind money tripping, which is the name of the road trip. I'm Bailey Reitzel. I'm a freelance journalist at the moment, but I started out as a financial reporter for American Banker and Payment Source, um, writing about um, payment tech, uh, more specifically Bitcoin and blockchain tech. Most recently, I went on a six-month, 48-state drive where I covered political culture in the U.S., spent about three days per state, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but talk to people about money, what they do with money, what they think about politics. Actually, that's sort of interesting because what I found was I, I did not want the road trip to be political by any means because I had a bunch of my family members and my family members' friends who were going to read it and I do not align politically with how my family aligns. So I didn't want it to get political, but as soon as I started asking people about money, they started talking politics. But that's probably also because it's an election year and so all the presidential candidates were on the TV screens at the bars and coffee shops that I was so frequenting. on people's minds. So it was on people's just minds, triggers yeah. other things that they yeah, yeah, yeah. About. But I do think that money is like ultimately political. Um, there's no doubt about it. So that was sort of an interesting shift in my coverage. It started getting way more political then. And yeah, that's called money tripping. Let's start a little bit closer to the beginning. How did you become a writer? <clears throat> So I actually started in speech pathology. I've always, I don't know, I've been a reader and a writer all my life, I guess, but I think it's sort of silly to say stuff like that. It's like when Britney Spears says, oh, I was like playing a guitar when I was three. Well, yeah, everybody was because kids do everything. So I think it's more as you mature, you try to find what you're, what you're good at or what you want to do. But I really wanted to travel quite a bit. Uh, my family are, my family is a big traveling family. So from speech pathology, I moved into journalism, just thinking I'm good at writing and I'll get to travel around. My idea was that I'd work for like National Geographic and be sent to all these cool places and really write about people is what I like to write about mostly. So yeah, that's sort of how I started in journalism. I did several internships in Missouri and was really just looking for a way out of Missouri. So took this job writing about credit unions in Washington, DC. And you know, I knew nothing really about credit unions. I knew nothing about finance necessarily, but took the job to get out of Missouri and found that I really quite liked it. Um, it was really interesting learning about all that sort of stuff. And I think sort of that credit union experience, I was only there for about six months, but that got me interested in sort of cooperative movements, which I think Bitcoin is a part of, even though that narrative has sort of shifted a bit. So you started writing in finance, moved to New York. Yeah, moved to New York. So after six months, um, found the job at American Banker in New York because I wanted to focus specifically on the technology in the financial sector. Um, And so they offered me the position writing about payments tech. Um, I had come into Bitcoin off that Gawker article from 2012 about Silk Road and buying any drug imaginable. Um, and so I was interested in it then. The editor at American Banker is super interested in Bitcoin. And so little by little started writing about it and then it took off. So right American Banker was one of the first major publications to really have any sort of a Bitcoin focus, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would guess so. Which is super interesting because it's also a trade publication. It's not consumer focused. And right. Bitcoin definitely started as more of a consumer push than a bank push. Yeah. Now everyone takes for granted the fact that banks love the blockchain and are very interested in how Bitcoin works. Right. But back then, Bitcoin was the only coin available. There was no, mm-hmm. they didn't even know about the technology back then. Yeah. There wasn't any idea of like, oh, we can strip Bitcoin, the currency from the blockchain. Um, Which is still a question if that's possible. I, I think it is still a question. I mean, <laughs> I, I understand the idea of a private ledger. I think there's still value there. But I think the value is less than sure. And I think a lot of these projects that are like private permission blockchain focused, you know, it's still yet to be seen whether they can pull this off um, because everything's sort of in pilot or proof of concept phases. And so the Bitcoin community has, you know, an angle there to say we're the only ones up and running and we've been up and running for 
since 2008 or whatever. So Seven and a half years now, yeah. I think. Do you remember any reactions of banks as you're all of a sudden feeding them with content of something they've never heard of? Because huh. that's, you know, the transition of now they, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, they're, they're all working on it. But obviously it's, I, I would assume that a number of the executives found out about it through your writing and through American Banker being the first ones sure. covering. Do you remember any Oh, that's reactions such a good of... question. And I wish that I still had access to my email address because it'd be really great to like go back through those. Yeah, I'm sure there's some funny reactions of like, this I'm will sure never work. And yeah, I'm sure there's people great that stuff. would now eat the words. Yeah, most of it was probably skepticism. From what I can remember writing about, I was writing about the companies in the space and how they were going to sort of like take on traditional financial services. Mm -hmm. And it was hardly ever where I would get a bank to comment um, at all. So they wouldn't say they were skeptical. They just wouldn't <laughs> talk to me about it. You know, I would hardly ever get regulators to comment, nothing like that. Yeah, no one so, really yeah, cared back then. No, it was like no asking one. someone, to, what do you think about the the gas content on Pluto? Yeah. I, right. I don't know, I don't care. Right. And I, it's so it's surprising to me that American Banker let me cover it as much as I did. I mean, I do think that's a direct correlation with Mark Hochstein, who's the editor over there, and his interest in Bitcoin. You know, I was covering it all the time, and a bunch of companies that I covered back in the day are like no longer around. <laughs> and it's not necessarily because they were bad companies, they were just a little bit too soon. They were before regulation, and once regulation hit, it's like, oh shit, what do we do now? Yeah. I can't remember the name of that exchange, the New York exchange, it was like one of the best or bigger Bitcoin exchanges. John Holmquist was the lead of that and they got hacked and he ended up disclosing like how they got hacked and that was like one of the bigger stories I thought I wrote because it's like so interesting this guy would come out and be like I screwed up here and I'm gonna do what I can to get this money back. Um, Very atypical financial institution yeah. behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really fun to cover it because people were, um, and I think even still, like people in the Bitcoin space and more generally cryptocurrency space, they tend to not have as much of a filter as traditional <laughs> financial institutions. So you can really get some great quotes out of them. And not that I'm like trying to, to get a gotcha quote or anything like that, but they'll be more, um, they'll be more real with you. They'll tell you things that maybe like a bank can't say or right. won't say because it could be misconstrued. They've been conditioned to yeah, not sure. breach certain subjects, sure. whereas these new guys don't know. Yeah, don't know what's what the rules are. Right. So it was really interesting to cover the space back then, and then in terms of like as as Bitcoin sort of progressed, you just had a bunch of people that were skeptical. I still think you have like a bunch of skepticism, which is fine. There should be. Um, but like Western Union and MoneyGram executives just saying like, you know, this means nothing to us. This is never going to be anything. And they've sort of stepped back from that. You know, it's not like they're going to implement Bitcoin right away. Um, they're trying to figure out where it fits in their business model um, as a regulated financial entity. Um, but they've stepped back from that sort of harsh criticism of it that they initially had. Working in New York as a writer for American Banker, and then one day you decided I'm going to drive ac across America and write about it on my own. How did that mm -hmm. transition happen? Early last year, I spent six months in London um, with Payment Source. Um, so that was just, I want to move, and they allowed me to do that. They wanted to sort of try and get an audience in the UK. So most of our audience is in the US. It's pretty obvious. I mean, the main brand is American Banker, so it's very US focused. But I sort of wanted to live over there. They let me try it. Um, and so I was writing for them. When I was in London, I just, there's a huge scene of squatters in London and just sort of these like anarchist types, which is not as big here in the US. Um, and I think that's because there are rules against squatting. So in London, like if there's a building that's been abandoned for a certain amount of time, squatters can take it over legally. And the owner of the building has to then go to court and say, you know, I want them out now. Um, so uh, that's not the case here in the U.S. So that's why sort of the squatter scene is a bit bigger. Anyway, I started hanging out with a bunch of anarchists and activists and whatnot. And they sort of inspired me to do my own thing. Like, yeah, they, I mean, it was a direct inspiration from some of their stuff. It's just like going out, doing your own thing, not working for the man kind of mentality. How did you meet them? Um, Bitcoin stuff, actually. <laughs> a lot of the times Bitcoin stuff. Um, so one person in particular was Brett Scott, who um, tends to be quite critical of the Bitcoin space, but I mean, also um, thinks that it's a very great alternative to the financial traditional financial industry and is like pushing back on them, making them work harder. Um, 
But so I spent a lot of time with him, um, Dave Birch, who's also in London. There was just like a huge group of people also talking about the history of money and predominantly because Bitcoin is a thing. And so it's like, well, let's go back. Why is Bitcoin a thing now? Um, you know, does that say anything about money's past or about money's future? Um, so there was these huge philosophical questions sort of just like going around in the UK scene and mm -hmm. that sort of inspired me to dig further. That was sort of the initial underlying of money tripping, which was the road trip, um, was I wanted to explore where money came from, like the history of money. Um, and when I went out on the road, I just found that most people are not thinking about that kind of stuff. So it would have been a blog of like my philosophical rants <laughs> instead of seeing how people actually interact with money. But you know, when I would ask like, do you think money came from barter or from like a central authority that needed taxes or for religious purposes, people were like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Never so, thought about that. No. Even being a possible question. No, no, not at all. Wasn't on my high school test. So I don't sure. Know. Yeah. Yeah. So stats from your trip, you left when, you stopped when, you, how many miles, where did you go? I started July 30th. I started from Missouri, which is where I grew up, um, and went to Illinois, went to Chicago. July 30th of last year? Yes, July 30th of 2015. Okay. And I ended in Jan the end of January 2016, so it was six months. Initially it was going to be five months, but it's just, I was really booking it. Um, three days of state is real challenging once you start getting out west where everything's you know, a I was day doing, of driving at least. Yeah, 10, 13 hours a day in driving and then, you know, needing to stay around to talk to people um, while also being physically exhausted. <laughs> so I moved it to six months and then, so I did a whole 48 state drive. It was so not. Everything except Alaska and Hawaii. Yes, everything except Alaska and Hawaii. Wow. It was really great. I wish I was still out on the road. <laughs> um, it's really strange to not be on the road still and talking to. A whole lot of people so I came to this idea and I don't know if this makes any sense for the podcast but um, <clears throat> so I now live in Colorado I live in Colorado Springs and I have this group of friends who have known each other for forever and so I sort of feel like the outcast in the situation I mean I am there's no doubt about it except they like me it's just I get self-conscious about them not liking me you're, and it's, you're the new one right and it's almost like that stems from being on the road because when you're on the road um, I have friends all over the country and I would come in and they knew I was only coming in for like three days So everything was about me. So this is sort of my <laughs> egotism at work It's like everything, you know, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? I have all these people for you to meet and now that I'm set stable that doesn't happen, right? It, everything's you're, not about you me. You got accustomed anymore. to being the guest that right. was on this cool epic adventure right, and so right, right, on right. the show Hey, my Kentucky is so amazing. Let me show you the cool things about exactly. it. We'll, exactly. So that kind of became your, your normal, that high mm -hmm. became your, your day to day right. living. And so it's, it's just challenging to reintegrate into society <laughs> sometimes when you've had an experience like that, which I'm doing just fine. But there's like a little bit of egotism <laughs> You're gonna make that it? comes with getting off, you know, a big trip where you've been the center of attention. Yeah. Now that you so mentioned that, I wonder how much overall just tourism and travel. How, what percentage of it is that kind of rock star feeling of, you know, being in this new country and people wanting to show you around and just make yeah. sure that you have that good time. Oh, yeah. That's kind of the, you know, the vacation travel, one of the uh, big benefits yeah, mentally. Absolutely. Of... absolutely. And it's like, you know, I didn't necessarily start out like this because I was trying to write for... Um, a more traditional financial audience. Um, so I still wanted the people who read American Banker to read my stuff. And I had an audience there, I had momentum there. So I wanted to keep it like sort of PC. But as the road trip went on, it just became more and more of a vacation. Um, <laughs> where it's like, you know what? No, I'm just gonna do whatever I want. And I actually think that turned into better stuff when I explored, you know, different cultures. So like in LA, I was hanging out with a bunch of burner friends, you know, they, they all do a bunch of drugs, weed and cocaine and ketamine and everything else. And like those ended up turning into way better stories because they're way more personal. And they show how people are actually using money or actually think about politics instead of sort of these like um, contrived sound bites. Instead of the yeah. what they would be interviewed as, right. what can I publicly say about how I sure. think about value and yeah, sure. money and the politics that go mm -hmm. with it. And like, you know, I was... I tried to keep that in mind. I am very happy to self-incriminate myself usually, um, but I try to, you know, um, change names and locations and whatnot. Protect me. Protect yeah. the innocent. I mean, I guess, yeah, but I'm I I don't get super scared about that kind of stuff, like the government, like 
watching what I text and like gonna like, pull me over and put me in jail for like a, a very small drug crime, but it happens, right? But I just have the privilege of not having to worry about that probably as much as like maybe other minority groups have to. So that is my privilege. Being a white female is, there are advantages to that for sure. There are advantages on the road as well. Like um, people are more willing to talk to you. If you're sitting alone at a bar, people will come up to you and talk to you, typically males. Um, not that that's necessarily a problem, but you, you're you like the least intimidating person in America <laughs> if you're a white female. <laughs> People will open up to you faster yeah. than, than others. Definitely, yes. How did you, I, I think a lot of people have a dream of dropping everything and doing a road trip across America or you know, driving across the world. How did you pull this off? So when I was over in London, I was house sitting. Um, and also a full-time physician at American Bankers. So I was saving up quite a bit of money over there. Um, so saved up that, moved out of New York, got my deposit back. It's just, I, I ended up having the sum of money that I thought I could live for six months on. And also I had momentum to sort of go off on my own. I had been thinking about going off on my own for you know maybe a year or so, just cause I had this like Bitcoin audience that that I felt would sort of support me, especially with like the Bitcoin micropayment sort of thing, like micropaying for content. And now I didn't actually find that work out quite as well as I thought it would on the road. But yeah, you, you kind of see that you have momentum in a space maybe and you like make that leap. Also, I have a safety net. There is no doubt about it that that is part of my privilege as well. Like I could go home. Like if I didn't make it, if I ran out of money, I have a family in Missouri. They have a house i could live there without right. paying rent um and some people don't have that so yeah i had a safety net i had this chunk of change i know how to live pretty frugally to be quite honest and a lot of the times that was because i traveled so much when i was younger and you kind of figure out you know where's the best place to stay i stay in a lot of hostels but i started out with eight thousand dollars in my savings account and did a little bit of freelance on the road. So probably in total, I spent $12,000 in six months wow. on the road. Mm -hmm. Probably, what, half of that on gas? Yeah, oh, most definitely, <laughs> most definitely. Cause I hardly ever like, uh, most of the time I was staying with friends, friends of friends, family of friends, random strangers that told me I could crash at their house. Um, so I stayed at hostels like a couple times. I stayed at mo like cheap motels a couple times. Um, and that ended up being like further along. So the last like month, I probably stayed at more motels than I did the prior five months just because I was getting exhausted, you know, like. <laughs> just I wanted mean, your own space, yeah, just crash sure. and sleep and not have to talk to anybody. Yeah, and yeah. That's but, understandable. Yeah, I drove back into Missouri with $300 in my account and then wow. yeah, started working again. <laughs> so anyone that wants to do it? 12 grand and you can touch every state and yeah and yeah, I could have done it I could have done it for less um, maybe not much less but you could have done it for less if I had a pack camping gear um, so I actually have met now like a whole bunch of travelers because <clears throat> so one of my former co-workers um, wrote a Q&A about money tripping like the first month that I started and it got picked up by the Atlantic which was amazing for my blog numbers because it's like quite hard to market yourself when you're on the road all the time and just in general it's hard to like get your name out there yeah um but because of that i had started having all these like digital nomad characters um reach out to me and people who had lived in bands for long periods of time and everything else how do you see being a writer as an entrepreneur in 2016 of all professions that have been around for a while writing is one that's really changed the the economic dynamic in the last, let's call it 10 or 20 years. How, how do writers, you, know, you now are a freelance writer, is that right? Mm -hmm. How do you get paid? This is such a challenging question. <laughs> uh, I actually, so I spoke to a college class about this. They were all like, they wanted to be like novel writers mostly, but there were a couple of journalists. But it's just like, it's really a lot of networking and getting your name out there. If I did not have Amer American Banker and Payment Source behind me in those three years of like making contacts with all these people, I could not do it. There'd be no way. But yeah, you get in with one person and they might know another person. So it's always easier to get a writing gig, a freelance writing gig, if you have a direct contact. Like just pitching to their um, pitch here at 
whoever.com, you're probably not going to get anything back. Mm -hmm. Or I have not had success with that a whole lot of times. Um, because I'm sure they're just getting flooded with emails all the time and they have their own set of full-time staff. So, you know, they probably don't even look at that so much. Um, but most of the freelancers that are making it now had ins places, um, you know, knew, knew the right people. Although I will say that the Bitcoin blockchain beat has helped a lot because there isn't many people that write about this topic and have written about this topic for so long. So, a lot of publications are always looking for people to write about Bitcoin and write yeah. about it in like a very coherent way and not sort of just like espousing like the philosophical beliefs of the Bitcoin community. Um, <laughs> you need people who seriously know things about this magic internet money. Yeah, <laughs> Who's right, out there? right, right. So that's been helpful. I mean, that's most of the gigs that I get right now. So I write for Coindesk pretty frequently. People that I pitch to, for instance, if I pitch them some story, um, they might say no to that story, but then they'll come back and be like, you know, will you write something about blockchain? So I've been typecast as that, and it's hard to overcome that typecast. You can do it, it's just, it's challenging to get your name out there. And you always have to fall back, sort of, you know, like, mm -hmm. I could be pitching a whole bunch of political, political articles to a whole bunch of different publications, and just doing that over and over, but I'm always gonna have to fall back, sort of, on the Bitcoin blockchain thing, because I know I can get jobs there. Right. And then, you know, I also told, the class as well that sometimes um, you don't actually know what you want to write about or you don't know what you want or maybe you thought something was boring but it's actually interesting once you get in there like I you know didn't aspire to be a financial reporter but once I got in I loved it um, you know I wanted to be a travel reporter and so how I've done that is you know find an interesting niche in finance and then make those two worlds meet right so you know, I want to go on Traveling a 48 state drive, right? What do I do? Exactly. Oh, I can write about finance still and like have momentum there. And um, yeah, that was sort of the other thing I wanted to mention is just that people did support me on the road trip. It was not enough to like, you know, carry me throughout. But I think I got about $1,500 in tips, um, most of them through PayPal and not through Bitcoin. <laughs> but I did have some Bitcoin tips. I did. But it was all via change tip. There's always been a lot of discussion about Bitcoin and tipping and that being the new form of media. Mm -hmm. But I don't think tipping has really ever taken off, no matter what the medium is, mm -hmm. except when people feel guilty that that is expected, which, you know, like in the, the service industry. Okay, sure. There's the, the guilt associated with not tipping, which for whatever reason does not translate into many other fields like media mm -hmm. or anything else. And I'm sure we could talk for hours and make guesses why but that seems to be yeah uh, I don't I don't know right except that it's like sort of a commodity like everybody can be a blogger so I think there's this idea that it's not so difficult and I mean I think I would argue that like physical labor is more challenging than mental labor um, some people feel differently about that um, I would suspect I forget uh, what the name of the phenomenon is but there's a phenomenon like if someone is stuck under a car or has something going on and there's like 50 people around in New York City, it's far more likely that each individual person will not want to help because they'll assume that the crowd, someone else in the crowd will do it. Sure. Whereas if you're in the middle of Kansas and you, you know you're the only one on the road and there's someone broken down, you're going to stop and help them. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if there's that dynamic of if you don't tip your server, you're their table, they're going to go home and not make much money. Whereas with writers, you think, well, a million people just read that, so I don't need to tip because everybody else will. Oh, I think there's that, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's just hard to like upend sort of this advertising model. I know there's people trying. They would like to move away from advertising and into yeah. tipping, for lack of a better word. But that's going to be super challenging. It's going to be challenging to get consumers to Chicken consent and to that. Problem. And it's going to be super challenging to get all these companies who are built on the advertising model to then switch without destroying some of their revenue. And that's, you know, micropayments, really cool idea for Bitcoin or like another cryptocurrency maybe. Interesting idea, but what these startups tend to forget, they build this platform and they're like, okay, here's this platform that you can move to. But they haven't really thought about how those companies keep all that revenue that they're used to getting. And so they don't come to them with this this platform that's also, hey, you get the same amount of revenue, you're not losing anything, you won't have to fire anybody or, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so that remains like a struggle. Yeah. It's hard to get people to switch from one platform to another. Right. So you can live basically anywhere in the world and do freelance writing, right? You're to um, that point where yes. your location doesn't really matter? 
Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter in the States, but like I have to get a visa to go anywhere else. Well, yeah. Um, which on like a freelancer budget, maybe other people are doing way better at freelance than I am. Um, but there's no way they would give me a visa unless it was just like a tourist visa. So I could go somewhere for six months and then I have to come back. But, um, otherwise like I've, you know, I would love to live in London again, mm -hmm. but an entrepreneur visa means you have to be doing something in that country. There's like certain types of visas where it's sort of like an entrepreneur visa, but then you have to have this chunk of change in your account, which I don't. Because I'm usually living like very cash strapped and like you know, month to month, if you will. And then otherwise, I have to get somebody to support me to go over there, which means I would have to go back to full time work. Right. There's always people wanting to protect their imaginary lines to make sure that people are on the right side sure. of them. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I support that libertarian cause of like no <laughs> borders. I mean, I understand where borders Move where you from. want to would be, yeah. Yeah, but it is, it's really cool frustrating. And try. it's, Especially frustrating, like, um, so I've talked to Indian people and also people from South Africa. They have to get visas no matter how many days they're going. This was like total mind blown when I heard this because I was just like this American. I get to go wherever I want for three to six months and like, you know, I get this visa. Of course, they're going to accept it. If I just want to go over there for a week, I don't have to get a visa or even wait. I don't have to get a visa for three to six months, huh? Yeah, that's a ton of time. Yeah. Um, and then I heard. Like, you get what's called a visa on arrival. Right. Automatically granted. Yeah. And then I hear that like some people have to get a visa for three days to speak at a conference in the U.S. or wherever they want to go. And that's crazy. That pisses me off, to be quite frank. There's this great Wax Taylor song about, like, are you free if, like, you need a passport to travel and you're not free to, like, roam about the country? Or not the country, but the world, like, the world that I live in that I, like... Yeah. You know, I didn't choose to be born in the U.S. or South Africa or India or Pakistan or whatever. Yeah, in a world where we're very conscious of sexism, racism, or at least in the U.S. especially, um, we, we try to overcome our any any sort of biases that are that come from the past. <clears throat> we're still very comfortable with uh, nationalism of where you're born determines a lot about. Um, what you're allowed to do. Sure. Not just, you know, where you're born into which your poor family, but the physical location in which government you're born under. There's a lot of, obviously, stereotypes about this this country, th these people are very much this way, and also just outright bans on working, living, traveling sure. in other parts of the world, which is seems like an outdated notion to me, but um, a, a lot of people fully back it, and I, I, I have trouble understanding the at least the moral reasons. I understand the historical accident why it happened. But. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, we could digress into this for a very <laughs> long time because I we've already digressed a little bit. So let's talk about um, the road trip. What surprised you the most about driving forty-eight states and asking people about money? So it probably wasn't anything that somebody said necessarily. But what I found was that that six months was like the longest six months of my life. And which is typically said when you don't like an experience. Right. Um, time flies when you're having fun. Right. Um, but this was not the case. And I mean, I, I was having a lot of fun, um, but it wasn't the case that time was flying. Um, mm. It felt like very still. And I almost think that's because you can sort of see how your life is playing out. Um, so the best example of this is uh, I met some, I met a guy in Montana who let me stay at his ranch. And then he hooked me up with somebody in Portland. Um, and then I ended up staying with him again with his cousin in El Paso. And so just being able to see how that one moment where I stopped at a bar in this small town in Montana has then got me through Portland without spending much money and then to El Paso. And like the stories that came from El Paso and Portland, like direct connection to this one person. And so you start seeing how like that one moment like changed. The result of fate. Sure, for right. For lack of a better word. Yeah, right. So like sort of changed your, changed your life. You know, it did. And it changed the narrative. And that's super interesting to see. And that also makes you like very present and makes it seem like a longer period of time than what is actually happening. You know, I think sort of when you get into this monotonous cycle, um, hmm. you know, it's time very can easy. Fly yeah, sure. Each day is like the last, whereas yeah. your life, right, right, right. one day you're driving in mountainous regions and the next year in a city yeah. hanging with 
Yeah. So I had to be present, which is like a very like hippie, present, yeah, hippie like twee thing to say, right? <laughs> but it's true. Like I had to be present in the moment, and that made it that that made it expand. That made it longer than typically would. What do Americans think about money? And maybe so, a, maybe a follow up question: What do Americans disagree on? Okay. What do they think about money? So there's two. There's probably more than two, but let's say there's two and there's like the money is evil thing. I heard that quite a bit. So money, of money is the root, is the of, root all of, all of all evil. And, you know, I don't want to have to think about money, but I have to blah, blah, blah. And then there's sort of this other contingent that maybe would agree with that, but they would never say it necessarily. It's like definitely this like we, you just have to have money and you you keep wanting more and more. It is what it is. Yeah. And they, they're like never satisfied, which I can totally agree. I totally get because I'm like a very unsatisfied person in general. That's why I travel so much and, you know, just need to be in new locations all the time. Um, but there are people that way with money. So it like s- tends to be like, um, you know, I make 50000 Now I got to make fifty-five, And, you know, it's just this want for more and more all more. the time. Um, and that's also with consumerism in general. So I sort of moved into consumerism. It wasn't just money, but what kind of toys do you need? Like I need this and I need this and I need this. And maybe the boat just sits around all day and I don't ever use it, but I have it. (laughs) So yeah, to me, it's a strange mentality, but I mean like that's sort of like capitalism at its finest, I suppose, or at its worst, (laughs) whichever (laughs) way you want to look at that. Um, (laughs) Getting a lot of stuff, or yeah, you got a lot of stuff. Um, and then as far as what people disagree on, so there is an idea that if you do not have as much money as the person beside you, you are probably not working as hard, um, which is just factually incorrect. That is not the case whatsoever. There are plenty of situations, you know, like I said, I have the safety net. Um, which means that I am more well off than somebody in my same position whose maybe family died. Um, So there are all these different situations where it's not about whether you're working hard or not. There's racism, prejudice, all these different things that account for that. Um, But there's still a pretty good subsection of the U.S. who um, lives by that mentality. Um, And not to digress into politics too much, but also I think that like we tend to not be as socialist as some of the other westernized societies, is we sort of think do it for yourself kind of, we're very individualistic. Um, We look at the individual instead of the whole. And so, you know, our social safety nets are sort of lacking in that way. Of the people that you spoke to, could you tell me what percentage don't talk about money or don't think about money? Money is 50% of all transactions. It's something we use throughout our lives. And yet most people don't understand it. They don't really think about it. It's just kind of part of their lives and they just take it for granted. Did you notice any sort of themes like that? Um, were people surprised that, of the questions you were asking? You know, like, you know, why did this why did this woman arrive in my town and start asking about money? Like, that's just crazy. They probably thought I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody told me point blank, <laughs> but I'm sure they did. Sure, yeah. Um, I think that I think yeah, you're right in that people don't think about money. Um, At least. Any, if they're any well, lower than, than like, you know, obviously people think I'd like more of it. My sure. bank account is X. My bills are Y. Obviously, that, that's a very normal thought. But beyond that, um, no, then no, like I don't feeling that anyway, I, I suspect because just my conversations about Bitcoin, explaining Bitcoin to someone is not just like, well, it's this Internet money and it does the, these things. It's like, well, how do you think about finance to begin with? And then we'll we'll contrast of how Bitcoin is different. And you kind of realize that people don't. Really think about the Federal Reserve and was barter first and, and how did we get this monetary system? Yeah, and, I would agree with that. No, not many people think through those questions. And I don't know that they have to necessarily teach yeah. their own. Um, although I would, I think it would be helpful if more people paid attention. Um, but again, I'm going to sort of go into this digression, but there's like this um, maybe like tech induced apathy uh, especially prevalent in the US um, where we want everything to be easy this is why I don't think people care about politics or have not cared about politics for a while we're sort of coming back to that maybe sort of with the when you get to like very extreme candidates like Bernie Sanders and Trump <laughs> anger will make people yeah anger the, and fear anger people make, will make people makes care. people pay attention sure but it's like we haven't had to think about it you know we have what we need I have food I have water I have this I have in that. relative terms America's had it pretty well off for sure. a century yeah, like and I, I just don't, I think it makes us sort of lazy. Politics is hard. Learning about money is hard. Not not super hard. Usually it's um, 
like in the financial services sector, they always use all these acronyms and like jargon <laughs> to make it seem harder than it actually is. Um, you Helps know, with job security. <laughs> yeah, and maybe that's that's a you know tinfoil hat conspiracy theory that they're trying to secure their jobs, um, and that's just the way it shook out that we need all these acronyms. But so so it's not that difficult. It's just that people like have stopped caring. Um, because they don't really have to, like, no matter who gets elected, nothing much changes. People could argue that, but it really hasn't necessarily. Yeah, so I think people just don't. And it's hard to see the connection between the federal funds rate or how well Bitcoin is doing or any el- anything else in the financial world, the stock market, and their day-to-day lives. Yeah, oh you know, yeah, if absolutely. If you're invested in the stock market, yeah, you're emotionally mm-hmm. invested, mm-hmm. but for the average person... Right. Sort of, we built these structures where everything's like very complex and it's all masked by this like nice layer of, you know, shine, if you want to call it that. Um, and I think tech does that too, to a certain extent. That's why sometimes I can be like, I'm not super into tech. I'm like, technology, what do you call that? Like a Luddite. Technophobia? Yeah. Yeah, Luddite. Yeah. Because it just masks everything. It obscures the fact that there's people working behind the scenes to make this stuff work. So this is like the Apple manufacturing in China and like having like sweatshops or any corporate having sweatshops. We sort of, we get removed from that. And so, you know, we buy into these products that I think are hurtful to society and to the environment. Like think of all the like food and and products that we purchase that the mass produced never chickens and yeah. yeah yeah all this stuff that's like pretty harmful but as jason king pointed out on one of the our other podcasts i think 50 billion dollars worth of food is wasted every year yeah and 49 million americans go hungry on a, a normal night yeah so there's a disconnect of insane. making too much yet not being able to get it to people who actually need it right right yeah and so well that's another thing that sort of happened in london is these these squatter kids So I was looking for a place to stay for a month, and so I was like, well, maybe I'll just stay in the squat with these guys, um, guys and girls. And I went in to, like, check this place out. They have, like, this little coffee shop in the front um, where they give, like, free coffee away, and then they have some clothes people can look through for free. And then I go back into the kitchen, and they have, like, more food than I've ever seen in my life. Like, and, like, all different kinds of breads. Like, better than I had eaten in five months living, (laughs) you know, like, house-sitting and buying my own groceries. But basically they were just, you know, the Aubon pans or the... Paneras would just dump their trash, leave the trash cans unlocked, and then they'd come and pull it out. And it's all still good food, you know. Um, maybe the date on it says today, but it's you know it's still good. Give you know, cut, right. cut a little piece go. of mold yeah. off and then go about your day. And that doesn't happen as much here in the U.S., but we have like a bunch of regulations yeah. on that kind of thing. For for reasons, we tend to be more litigious anyway americans um there's a lot more focus on making sure that there's safety sure. built into the system sure yeah less not risk. saying that like london doesn't have safety procedures for their food either but um do you have any crazy stories from your trip sure yeah absolutely <laughs> um <laughs> let's see i think one of the craziest stories and i just love this so much but so i went in nebraska i was in what West Platte, I believe it was called Nebraska, which is way west, middle of nowhere. Surprising amount of bars in this town of like, I don't know, several thousand people maybe. But I went into this one, I was sort of just drinking by myself at the bar and this group of group of people was hanging out my age, like a little bit younger. And one of them comes over and he's like, hey, you should go to this party with us. It's just like right down the block. I'm like, okay, cool. And he's like, we're all in town. We rode our our motorcycles into town for um, a male stripper convention. Like basically we're teaching males how to strip. (laughs) And so I'm immediately like, (laughs) oh shit, like this is going to be bad. You know, like just all these ideas pop into my head. Like what kind of party is this? These are like sex positive people, which I'm cool with, except I'm the outsider (laughs) and a female. And so all these sort of things are popping into my head. Um, And so he like, we go out back and he, you know, introduces me to his friends and they're all like in on it. They're all like, yeah, we're here for the stripping convention. They're dancing all over each other. And I'm like, okay, I'll go, you know? And then we walk two doors down and it's this huge warehouse space full of like 300 dudes probably. Um, And I'm like, this is not a stripper convention. And they're like, oh yeah, that was just a lie. They were actually military vets and in a biker gang. And they all descended upon West Platte and we're having this big party. And it was... 
I mean, just why would you lead with that? <laughs> like, where in your mind do you think like you <laughs> should m- pick up a lady by saying you're going to a stripper convention? <laughs> Except it worked. I was all like, I have to do it for the story. You know, I had to go. And I ended up having like... Um, one of the more inspiring situations. It's just all these people were um, tended to be quite different politically than I am. Um, and I could sort of push back um, to a certain extent. They were very hesitant. Um, I, you know, I was always taking notes on my phone and they were sort of looking over my shoulder and, you know, moonshine and all this. But it was, it was such a great experience. Wait, just, so these were 300 male... Military vets? Military vets, yeah. Most of them have been to Afghanistan or somewhere else in the Middle East. Um, And they just wanted to party together in Nebraska? Yeah, so I guess (laughs) they get together like once every maybe three months or something. And they just, you know, they're part of the same motorcycle gang. Or they don't want me to call it a gang. Motorcycle (laughs) club. And so they all, you know, got together in Nebraska. And it was so much fun. Um, and just nonsense, like the stuff that would come out of these people's mouths is insane. So no stripper poles? No stripper poles, no. Um, and there's like five or six women there, but yeah, mostly big burly guys (laughs) who had seen a lot of shit, you know? Um, but one of, like an experience that came out of that was, um, this one guy sort of like took a liking to me and so we kind of were like talking and hanging out quite a bit. We ended up going to a bar and then we came back and all this stuff. Um, but at one point he was talking like they were conservative besides socially, socially, they were pretty liberal. He was like, I don't care about, you know, same sex marriage or this and that. Um, except they were quite Islamoph- um, Islamophobic. Mm. Um, so they weren't super excited about Muslims coming to the country. And so he's talking to me and he's like, you know, if two gay guys walk in here and sit down and have a beer and don't talk shit, then I'm fine with them, right? I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. He's like, but if two Muslims come in here and then start talking shit, I'm going to have a problem. And I'm all like, you just changed the story, though. (laughs) Now the Muslims are talking shit. And, like, we're having this conversation. Yeah, that's not a fair comparison. Yeah, I'm like, you changed it. You changed the story. And he's all like, yeah, I did. Okay, I can see your point. And there was this (laughs) moment where I was just like... No one had pushed (gasps) back on him before. Yeah, no one had ever... that yeah. the Muslims would be taking talking shit because right. that's the, the group. Exactly. And I'm like, but what if they came into this bar and didn't talk shit? And he was like, well, they wouldn't come into a bar anyway because they're Muslim. And I'm like, you're you're dodging this question. <laughs> and like that moment where you're like not in an argument. You're not you're in an argument, but you're not yelling at each other. And it's not like I need to change You're actually mind. listening to each other. Right. And trying to figure out like where those thoughts come from. It obviously comes from the fact that the first time he went overseas, he was in a Middle Eastern country and people were trying to kill him. Um, so I get it. I get why he believes that. But that moment where it was just like illumination for the both of us, like, I see, you know, it's like such a good feeling. Um, I feel like most of the times when people argue, they're trying to argue to win. They always want to win. And so they don't listen to each other. Yeah. And so, yeah, just experiences like that where you get to know where people are coming from are really interesting. Do you have any stories related to entrepreneurship? There's just a huge contingent of young people in this country right now who, you know, the job market is shit. Um, unemployment is high and so what do you do you become an entrepreneur so there's a bunch of people who and there's also this idea that I don't want to work a nine-to-five anymore I don't want to put in a whole bunch of time at a company I don't believe in Um, and you know Millennials are pushing back on that idea so even if they don't get paid as much they're not gonna take that job they want to go and travel and you know I don't know be musicians for the rest of their lives not be the the corporate people that parents grandparents whatnot were before us sure yeah and and not saying that that's like necessarily a bad way of life you know I don't want to hate on you know the baby boomers or even grand my grandparents um, for doing that that's you know what was expected of them Mm -hmm. but now that we kind of we see that that doesn't have to be how we have to live we're pushing back on that and so a bunch of people like Yeah, food trucks. I found a bunch of people who were trying to do food trucks, a bunch of people doing, uh, being musicians and artists. And yeah, they'd have a job on the side, right? So they'd, you know, be a barista or like a couple of people I know in Cleveland um, work for the universities on grants, but then also do these music projects on the side and these art projects on the side. And so it's, yeah, that, I think that's super inspiring to me. So your analysis of sampling across the U.S. entrepreneurship in general amongst the youth is alive and well, whether it be positive forces or, or negative forces of why that is. There's a lot of people that are yeah, trying absolutely. to find their own way in the world and not just accept a job. I or... would say, yeah, I would say yes. And I also think that's because like we have, 
So for millennials, like the worst like unemployment rate, or I don't want to say that because then like somebody's going to call that out that it wasn't the worst of all time. But so we had a really mm-hmm. shitty job market growing up. And I think that's like a direct correlation with the fact that like older individuals will call us lazy. Like, hold on a second. We weren't lazy. There was just literally no jobs for us to fill. Um, and so you start seeing this like this explosion of all these like internet celebrities. Um, so YouTube is like a prime example of people like making money on YouTube. Like what else were they going to do? You know, you might call that like not a job or I can't believe they get paid for that. What else did you want them to do? And at least maybe they're doing something they loved and like they're probably not making millions of dollars doing it. So in one or two sentences, what did money tripping teach you? This is like the question of the book, right? That I still haven't figured out. Um, so yeah, the blog, I blogged every state and now I'm trying to turn it into like more of a novel instead of just like a, a sort of nonfiction narrative. And this is like the question that I'm asking myself is like, what did I learn? Like, what's the main theme here? And there's just so many, I just haven't figured out like where they all align. Although I talk a lot about um, sort of how the structures around us have removed us from a whole bunch of different factions of society, um, which is, I think, very negative. So it's like sort of the like environmental stuff we were talking about earlier and sort of... The disconnect like, of seeing actions and mm-hmm. reactions because yeah, yeah, there's yeah. either distance, time, technology in between the yes. input and the output. Absolutely. And so, you know, that's technological, but also I think people to people. So interacting with homeless people, homeless veterans, people that are way down on their luck, which I did a lot of, um, you, not a lot of people interact with those people. And so I don't think they understand their story. So you have the mentality of they're not working hard enough. They don't deserve these social safety nets that, you know, we could provide them. And I just, I don't think that's true. I think there are bad people. Sure. There are people who will scam the system. Um, I, I tend to think that it's not a very high percentage that usually you're either dealing with um, mental illness, which I mean, scammers might fall under that too. Maybe they have sort of a switch off mental illness or just like really hard times. And sometimes you just give up. That's like why the unemployment rate is a little bit lower than it should be because a yeah, lot that's of an interesting part of the up. statistics. Now the unemployment rate doesn't include people that have given up right. looking for work. Right, right, right. It's only people that are actively looking. Anyone sure. that's not not actively looking at, at they call it a different category and it's not even reported right. really much in the mainstream media as far as the temperature of the economy right I answered that in not two sentences yeah, or two I words gonna press, I was going to press you harder to see um, I know I'm putting you on the spot but. I know you are but maybe like American cynicism like and there's probably another word that needs to go in there but like maybe is structural the right word? Like American structural cynicism? Like I'm just I'm cynical about the way we have set up our world or our, our country. And I think all countries are dealing with this, but... What part of the structure are you Yeah, it's just about? this like utter removal from anything hard and challenging. Or like, <laughs> you know, like, or other people, right? This sort of like individualistic narrative as well that I think makes us not see the people around us and how much like they might be struggling over us. So Bailey, how can people follow you? Yeah, so you can you. follow me on Twitter. That's probably the easiest way. I'm at BLR13. Um, I'm also on Facebook. Just BLR13? B- BLR13, yeah. Okay. Um, and then moneytripping.com is where the blog is. Um, since I finished the road trip, I have not posted anything. I'm trying to figure out what I want to do to kind of keep that going. Um, well, you've got 50... 50 articles there, right? Yeah, okay. over over 50. Yeah, for sure. Because um, I did some like tangential stuff as well. Um, and then I'm on Facebook. I accept everybody on Facebook as well because I think like... Don't like technology get in the way of connecting with people? No, absolutely not. <laughs> um, and I don't care if like people that I work with see sort of my personal life. I think that just makes you like more appealing um, to people in general if they're like, oh, she has... She's not just this like journalist robot um, <laughs> who only writes about technology, who also does, you know, fun stuff. Um, so yeah, just Bailey Reitzel on Facebook. Can you spell that? Yeah, B-A-I-L-E-Y. And then Reitzel is R-E-U-T-Z-E-L. We'll put links for that in the show notes. Bailey, thank you so much for sitting down with Liberty Entrepreneurs. Yeah, thank and you. And we're excited to see your future 
money trips and adventures. Thank you for listening to Liberty Entrepreneurs. If you like this show, please tweet us at Liberty E Podcast. Find us on Facebook or LibertyEntrepreneurs.com. Thanks again to Bailey Reutzel. Your host was Justin Blinko. Show edited by Justin Blinko. Until next time, keep building freedom.